Welcome, everybody. This is Arielle Ford, and this is your Everything You Should Know free teleseminar event. And tonight, my very special guest is Deborah Genovese, and we're going to be talking about the mediagenic, tell it to sell it on TV and radio. And Deborah is with Communications Co-Pilot. She is a media trainer who prepares authors and experts to dazzle on TV and radio interviews. She teach, he'll teach you how to design and communicate a message that gets heard and will move audiences to action so that you sell as well as tell. You'll also learn how to, how to play the media game while naturally being yourself on the air. This is really, really important. And she'll teach you how to attract the ideal clients, sell your products, and get known. Deborah, welcome to the call. Thank you so much, Arielle. I'm so excited to be here today. I'm glad to be talking with all of your great people and chatting with you. Oh, great. And this is such a critically important topic. I'm glad we're finally going to be able to do this because you can write the best book in the world, but if you don't know how to sell it and you don't know how to share the information, it's all kind of a wasted energy. So. Before we really jump into it, how did you become the communications co-pilot? Oh, well, uh, a little bit about me. I actually started my career as a TV and radio reporter, and then I moved into public relations, and I worked at some of the largest global PR agencies in the world, uh, in New York, and Cleveland, and Los Angeles, and I had clients of all different sizes. I had some smaller ones right on up to the Fortune 500s, like General Electric, and Nintendo, and Sony and just a whole bunch of them over the years. And, you know, Ariel, you know I was also heavily involved in TV production during that time, and you and I actually got to work together on a few things. Uh, with right. Uh, Chopra, remember when we, okay. we did that whole peace conference in Puerto Rico? That was so much fun. And, it was. And then in the, it, yeah, it really was. And then in the last few years, I started my own company, Communications Co-Pilot, and I'm really focusing on media training. Um, and preparing people to shine in the media spotlight. So I tend to work nowadays with authors and experts who have a book or a product to sell, and they know they're going to be doing television and radio interviews. They might be going on a media tour, and they want to be properly trained so they can make the most of, of the airtime they're going to get. Mm, that's amazing. So today I know we're going to talk about how to be more mediagenic on TV and radio, and I know you've got an eight-step process. Can you sort of walk us through that? Sure. I'm really excited to tell you about it. Um, first, let me explain a little bit by what I mean by mediagenic, so everybody's clear on that. I think most people are pretty familiar with the term photogenic, which just means you look great in photos. And mediagenic is kind of the same idea. When you're mediagenic, it means you're appealing to the media because you do a great job whenever you appear on television or radio, and you look great, you sound great, you have interesting information to share. You're the whole package, and of course, media wants that. So today I'm going to give you a bunch of tips that will move everyone on the call towards being more mediagenic. And specifically, we'll get into that eight-step system that you mentioned, which I call the B mediagenic system, eight simple steps to tell it to sell it on TV and radio. And that system takes you step by step through setting the stage for your media success, then demystifying the media so that you totally understand how to play the game, and working on your key messaging and performance skills, then putting all of that together so that you actually have a customized blueprint or an, an organized plan of action so you can use that anytime you're going to be interviewed. And the great thing is that because of my background on both sides of the media equation in television and radio and then handling PR and branding on the corporate level, this program includes more than just what people typically think about when they hear media training. So you get to learn more. It's not just how you perform in the spotlight and, and what you say, although those are certainly very important elements, but we also look at the whole enchilada, you know, how to interact with the media in a totally comprehensive way so that when you do land those great interviews, you know just what you need to do to achieve your business goal. That makes so much sense. Okay, so where should we go from here? All right, well, first I would say probably the people who can most benefit from this info, certainly authors who want to, as you said, 
who want to promote book sales, they need to be media savvy. But really, anyone who has a product or a service to sell, and they know they're going to be using TV and radio to reach a large audience. And, you know, the thing about a large audience is the blessing and a curse. If you have a great interview and it all goes well, then your business can really skyrocket. But unfortunately, if you blow it, you're going to bomb out in front of a lot of people at once. So there's a lot at stake, and, you know, you really want to get it right. Um, so I would say some other people who might be able to benefit from the info are the people who work with authors, like publicists and publishers, and, and people who help the author land media interviews, and they want to see them make the most of those opportunities. Right. Yeah, I know when I was doing book publicity, I was totally insistent that every author be media trained for every single book. So it's not a one-time process, because the messaging changes. And you have to be trained for each yeah. book. And I think what people don't really understand about doing interviews is that even after you've written a book, speaking the book and languaging the book and knowing how to make short, potent, pithy sound bites around the book isn't a skill we're born with. And it's really something that, that grows with age. So if you're thinking you're going to get media trained three days before your first interview, <laughs> it's a huge mistake. <laughs> huge yeah. mistake. Yeah. So you really want to start thinking about that now. And um, you know, most of the people on this call already know how important it is to build a platform. But can you talk a little bit about how media fits into that? Yes, absolutely. I know Ariel, you talk quite a bit about how it's really not your book idea that sells the book to the publisher. It's how well you've built your platform. It's really important. And, you know, a lot of people on the call know this already. Um, you need to demonstrate when you pitch your book idea, whether you're pitching it to a publisher or to the media, they all want to see that you're a very influential person in your field. They want to see legitimacy and credibility. And before you ever get a book deal, they want to know that you have a, the loyal support of a large community of fans, people who are hungry for everything you produce, whether it's a book or a DVD system or whatever you're going to create next. They just want proof that, you know, there's there's a group of people out there that really want what you have. And the media is the same exact way. I mean, they want to see that you're a credible expert and, you know, it's ironic because sort of the best way to build up that platform and contribute to getting an expert status is really to be all over in the media. So on TV and radio and print and online and blogging and you name it. All of those things establish your reputation as being a respected leader in your field. So when you do get media interested in talking with you or your publicist, if you're working with publicists, gets you booked on a show, you better shine. I, You know, media appearances are a major way to build that platform, and you just can't, you not only can't do a poor job, you can't even be me mediocre. I mean, you have to stand out and dazzle. Dazzling is a good thing. Okay, so um, I know you're going to share the eight-step program. What's step number one? Step number one is setting a baseline. And all that means is when you take stock of where you are now in regard to your media appearances versus where you want to go. And if you've been on TV and radio before or you've even been in print media, this is the time to take a close look at what's working and what isn't in terms of your branding and building your business. And you can still do this step even if you're just starting out and you don't have much or any media experience. You can start by looking at how do you talk about your business when you're out networking or if you're speaking and giving presentations in front of groups. You know, I generally recommend that people videotape themselves. And with my private clients, we go over any previous media appearances. Or if they don't have that, we do mock interviews to kind of set that baseline. And then we have a better sense of where they need to improve to take them from good to great. And what, what comes after that? Well, after that, step two is you want to look at your media outreach plan, so creating the media outreach plan. And I actually just wrote a blog about this. People can find that on my website. It's comscopilot.com, C-O-M-M-S, copilot.com. This is a really important step because you can work all day on what you want to say and how to say it, but if you're targeting the wrong media outlets, you'll just be frustrated. I mean, what I'd like everybody on the call to understand is that you should be really judicious and smart about what TV and radio programs or print and online media that you target. Because 
getting on media just for media's sake really doesn't do a lot to move the needle on your sales. And getting on a TV or radio show is the means to the prize. It's not the prize itself. Because if the audience for that show are not the people who want and need your book or, the, or your service or your product, you're just wasting your time. So in this step, you want to carefully define your target audience. Just think about who wants what you have. And then identify what media they consume. What are they reading? What are they watching? What are they listening to? That's the sweet spot. And that's the media that you or your publicist should be focusing on in your media outreach plan. It's really important that you approach media as part of an overall strategy. You don't want a scattershot approach where you're just sort of shooting it out there and seeing what, what sticks. Although I would say that the caveat to that is if you're just starting out and you want to get some nice looking media clips on your website of you performing on television or radio, then in that case it's worth getting in wherever they'll have you. But I would say at least 90% of your time should be chasing after media that appeals to the direct audience you're selling to. And this step is also the time to consider whether you want to appear on pay-for-play TV shows, you know, morning shows where you actually have to pay to be on. It could make sense for you in your, in your business. You might want to look at other non-traditional media outlets. Maybe you want to be a spokesperson for a satellite media tour, or you want to look at paid placements on a cable station. All of those are things that you should be looking at in step two. Yeah, and the thing that I always tell people to do is have a media wish list and then become a student of that wish list. So if you're saying, you know, you want to be on, um, you know, like right now, if I could be on any show in the world, it would be Ellen DeGeneres. You know, that's where I would want to be. So I watch the Ellen show, you know, and I pay attention and I start looking to see, you know, where am I a fit? And then I call my publicist and say, oh, you know, Ellen did this kind of show today. Maybe we should pitch her this way or that way. So you want to be really proactive and not just, you know, sitting around wishing and hoping, but actually become a student of the media. That's very smart. And, you know, what you said about, you know, everybody sort of has an idea of, well, I, you know, I just want to be on Ellen because I know she has a big reach. But what you're doing is you're actually being a little detective, in, which is really smart, and looking at, okay, how does this show tick? Who's she appealing to? How can I appeal to her? What kind of stories does she like? And that's exactly what you should be doing. Yeah. So what happens next? Well, next, step three, is creating and polishing your media-savvy brand. So some people on this call who have bus and been, been in business longer probably need a little less work here because they already have a well-functioning brand that's been developed, somebody like you, Ariel. But some need some help building that up. And either way, you still need to view your brand through the eyes of the media and make sure that it's media-friendly and something that will appeal to a wide chunk of the audience where you're targeting. So this is the step where you need to explore whether your business and your brand is set up for media success. So here's what I mean by that. If you landed an interview on a, on a big show, say Ellen DeGeneres, and tens of thousands of viewers all of a sudden went to your website, is it set up to maximize that experience? I mean, first of all, can you technically handle that many people coming in without crashing? And also, do you have a mechanism put in place, I know you do, Ariel, but do you have a mechanism in place like an opt-in box with a juicy free opt-in offer that's going to capture all the visitors that come in, and then you can market to those people who you already know have an interest in you with your e-scene or an email sequence or you know whatever you want to do from there. You have to look at, is your website clearly pointing the new visitors to the valuable information you want them to know about? And is it making them take the next step with you? So you want to have information about your offering so it's clear what you do and how they can work with you or get your book. And I, I actually have a quick cautionary tale to tell here. Um, a friend of mine, I won't mention her name because it's a little bit of an embarrassing story, but she's a well-known fitness and nutrition expert. And she was actually a regular, <clears throat> excuse me, on the Dr. Phil show for two seasons. And during that entire time, she didn't have an opt-in box or anything on her website to capture email addresses from people who looked her up. And this is one smart lady. She is a marketing whiz now, and she has her own show, so she worked it all out. But when she tells this story, she says she can't believe she's so naive, and she's really embarrassed about all that missed opportunity. She had two years on a national show and reached millions of people, and she didn't have a way to connect with any of them. 
So, you know, any, you don't want that to happen to you. And, you know, I would also... I had a friend who did the same thing. She was on National Show for two years and didn't even have a website up. So even if somebody wanted to search her, they couldn't find her. Yeah. Wasted. I mean, it it happens. And, you know, I mean, it's easy for things to slip through the the cracks. So, you know, when you're looking at this step of, of making your brand media savvy, you want to look at stuff like that. You also want to look at... You know, do you have a media room or, or a, a tab on your site where journalists can go to get all of your relevant info, your press kit, photos of you, bio info, everything they would need just all in one spot. And if you have some prior media appearances under your belt, you want to make sure those are prominent on your website along with the logos and the call letters of the station and the program's name. All of those things are lending to your credibility and it establishes you firmly as an expert to the visitors, but also to the media who research you before your interview. So, you know, I would say the the last thing I'll say about this and, and, you know, creating a media savvy brand, it's about how to make your media pitches irresistible. And that ties in with giving media what they want. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. That's in another one of our steps. But understanding what the media viewers and listeners want. I mean, yeah. some ideas to, you know, I, that, that's really the important part of it. It's not really what you want. It's about what the media will want. And you can make yourself more media friendly by doing things like using a human interest angle. People like stories about people. They yeah, let's don't want talk, to hold... talk about a little, talk some more about storytelling and sure, the importance sure. of that. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, it's really important that you relate things in a personal way to people. And storytelling is a great way to do that because you you key into people's emotions. We're geared as people, you know, going all the way back to caveman time, sitting around the fire and talking about, you know, the latest, the kill, you know, what what happened that day when all the men went and got the big whatever they ate, (laughs) mastodon or something. The (laughs) buffalo. Yeah, buffalo or something. You know, I mean, we're... We're all keyed in to listen to stories. We're interested in other people. You know, we want to know what's going on with them. So when you're on the media, make make yourself a little storyteller. Tell tell a little story about what it is you want to say. You know, that's much better than a, than a dry, boring lecture. You don't want people to revert back to, you know, 10th grade geometry class and their eyes glaze over and, you know, you don't want that. And... You know, explain what a sound bite is and how do you create one? Sure. A sound bite. Well, a sound bite basically is, first of all, I want to say that if you're going to do sound bites, you definitely want to learn this skill. Talking in sound bites is probably the one thing journalists love more than anything, other than respecting their deadlines, which is probably their first thing, but it's how to deliver a great sound bite. And it actually protects you because when you learn to speak, in TV language, which is more radio language, which is sound bite language, you get quoted more and you get misquoted less. So it, it also helps you attract clients and joint venture partners. And I'll give you an example of some really great sound bites. There will be a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. Everybody knows the chicken in every pot, right? Here's one from Dr. Oz that I really like. He says, when he's explaining how people get illnesses like cancer, he says, your genes load the gun but your environment pulls the trigger. So, you know, these are short, pithy statements that you instantly understand the meaning. There's a little bit of a storytelling going on there as well, and people tend to remember them. And emotions are usually involved. It usually makes you feel a certain way, or at least makes you go, hmm, I wonder what that means. You know, the the entire world of advertising and promotions and sales just works this way. Uh, And... If I could give some tips on how to formulate your own sound bites, I would say, number one, you want to avoid jargon because you, sound bites have to be easily picked up and understood. You want to have some substance, so you want to say something. Don't just be clever. Clever is good, but you've got to say something. Um, be memorable. Ninety years later, people are still using the chicken in every pot quote. That's ninety years old. So right. that's pretty memorable. <laughs> I mean. You want to use action words. You want to use metaphors and analogies like that Dr. Oz gun and tr- trigger, you know. Yeah. And inject emotion whenever you can. Like I said, get people to feel something. Get them to laugh. Get them, get them to be shocked. Just get them to do something. You know, get them to feel something. 
And the last thing I would say about sound bites, they're great, but you don't want to overuse them because if every other phrase comes out sounding like a tagline, you're going to be, be perceived as just too slick and salesy. And if you use a normal conversational manner most of the time, but then you throw in a few sound bites, you sprinkle them in, then they become kind of like a movie marquee and they stand out and grab somebody's attention. Yeah, like for my book, Wabi Sabi Love, which is about finding the beauty and perfection in your own imperfections and those of your mate. It's a lot, I, I always tell a little story and then I say, really, the essence of Wabi Sabi Love is to move you from being annoyed to enjoyed. Oh, I love that. That's a perfect example. Yeah. yeah that's a perfect example. It's short, and it gets right to the point. That's just what you want to do. Right, and that's what people want. They don't want to be annoyed. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Hopefully. besides speaking in sound bites, what else can you share about how to tell it to sell it? Which sounds like a Randy Jackson, American Idol kind of, he's in it to win it kind of sound bite, right? <laughs> Oh, I know, doesn't it? Yeah, I kind of like that. See, so I'm, I'm doing sound bites there, too. Um, well, I would say, besides speaking in sound bites, probably if we went back to, like, uh, step four, that's understanding how the media works. And that's a real biggie, because if you don't get how the media actually works, then you're never going to give them what they want. So, you know, I'm a contributing author to a book that's coming out in late June called Media Magnetism. And... I wrote several chapters on this topic of just understanding the media because I just think it's so important. And, you know, the first thing people need to understand, you get caught up in the enthusiasm of your message, but remember, the media doesn't exist just to give you free publicity. I mean, that's not, that's not what they're about. So you've got to realize the whole system of how they're making money. And, you know, I apologize because this is obvious stuff. I'm sure you all know this intrinsically, but maybe it's not in front of your mind when you're pitching the media. They're making money based on ratings and readership numbers. And based on how high those are is how much they can sell ad space for. So they want to be really popular and have the biggest circulation and the biggest ratings and all that stuff so that they can make more money. It's just a business thing. So if you give them stories that help them get bigger numbers, then you're good as gold. you know. But if you get too promotional and salesy, they're just going to suggest, you know, a journal to kind of say, well, you need to buy ad space because this, this sounds more like right. ad Right, you don't want to be an infomercial. You actually want to be a contribution. Exactly, and I think people sometimes confuse, you know, because because a lot, there's, there's been a real blurring between editorial and, and advertising in the last few years. And so people get a little confused and they sometimes, you know, forget about that. But the bottom line is you got to approach the media just like you, you know, it's the golden rule, just like you would approach a business person. You go into it thinking, what can I do to help this person? And then, of course, when you help that person, the benefits are, are for everyone. But if you go in thinking, I've got to get this message across, it's all about me, this is what I'm going to say, these are, you know, my 15 message points, which we'll talk about that in a minute, that would be way too many, um, you know, then you're not going to do well. And, and they're not going to like that. Do you remember on KABC Radio in L.A., the Michael Jackson show? He was like the biggest talk radio host of the 80s and 90s on the number Michael one Jackson, station. Michael Jackson, the real Michael not, The Michael Jackson, the radio host, not the pop star. Different guy. But, oh, yeah, no. he, He's, a, he's a, a, a British gentleman, and he was the number one talk show radio host in Los Angeles and the number one market in the country for many, many years. And I used, I mean, getting a booking on his show was big, sold a lot of books. He was on, you know, drive time. He was huge. And I remember that he had this rule that if an author came on and said the words, in my book, you would never be on the show again because mm -hmm. he didn't want he didn't want you there teasing people. Well, you have to read my book or in my book. He wanted you there giving information. And he would tell people about your book, and he would talk about how great the book is. But the, author, the rule was the author was not allowed to. And I know one of the mistakes I see so often with author interviews is they're always saying, well, in my book or in my book, well, you'll have to read my book to learn this or that, which is right. just such a turnoff because you That's want to – It's a killer. It's a killer, yeah. You want to give away – all the information 
you know, and, and sometimes authors are thinking, if I give it all away, then why do they need to buy the book? And the truth is, they're not going to remember it all. And if you give them more content than they can possibly absorb, then of course they're going to want the book. So you don't want to be stingy. Uh, that's, that's a really good point. In fact, you know, one of the things I always say, the six words that authors should never say, and those six words are, the answer is in my book. Because right. that will, right, right, that right, will, right. Yeah, you will grind to a halt. That that journalists will not be happy with you. They'll probably cut the interview short, and that's not going to achieve your goal. You know, I mean, you get you catch more flies with honey. You do it their way, and it's all good. You try to you know get out there like an infomercial, all bad. Right. Um. So then, what's step seven? Okay, step seven is actually creating and refining your message points. So these are the points you want to try to work into every interview, regardless of what you're asked. And there's a way to do that seamlessly without seeming like you're dodging the question. It's a little more advanced media training technique, but it's something I do recommend to my clients because it's a great skill to be able to sort of subtly steer the reporter who maybe went off topic a little bit back to where you're more comfortable. So when you're working on this step, creating and refining the key message points, you want to keep in mind that you should boil down everything you have to say, as, as we were just saying, in a very simple three to five most important points. Aim for three. And you generally don't have a lot of time in a media interview, especially with television. And it's much better to cover three points well than to just kind of throw everything out there in a really confused way and sound like you're trying to jam it all in. So, you know, you, you don't want to lose the audience. So make sure that your points support your brand and move to action, like we talked about before. And the best way to do that is sort of plan out what action you want them to take and then reverse engineer your messaging to get that outcome. And once you get your message points, you want to put them in that sound bite o -matic. You know, you want to condense them so that they're more succinct, snappy. And most of us, I think, get so close to our own topic that we tend to go overboard. And then in our enthusiasm, we lose people. So I mean, think about what you do when you watch TV. I know I'm doing a million other things. You know, you're you're in and out of the of the room. You're checking email. You're getting a meal prepared. You're doing a load of laundry. You know, if you have kids or pets, you're chasing after them. There's all kinds of things. So you've got to be sure that your messages really stand out to that person who is multitasking in a in a quick way. And another thing that I tell people to do not to do. Don't script out your message. Don't memorize a script before you go on air because you want this to be a comfortable conversation, not like a stiff dissertation. So, you know, if your message points are quick and easy for you to understand, then you know they're going to work better with the audience. You know, I mean, it just makes sense. Right, right, right. So, um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about that, that we haven't covered yet is talk a little bit about particularly TV interviews and what percentage of the message is nonverbal versus verbal. Oh, yeah, that's that's a good one. I would say that it's it's close to 90% is nonverbal. I mean, you really you say a lot with your facial expression, your body language, how you're expressing yourself, the the a vibe that you're projecting. Is it confident? Is it upbeat and joyful? Are you excited about your topic? Can, does that passion show through? You know, all of these things, even from the, the minute you step on the set, how you're sitting, you know, which way your body is faced. Are you leaning in to the reporter, you know, in a non-aggressive way, but in a way that shows that you're interested in engaging with them? Do you you know, are you looking at them and interacting with them like you would interact with your friend at Starbucks over a cup of coffee? Or are you sitting there ramrod straight, you know, stiff like you're before a firing line? I mean, th there's a whole lot that goes into that nonverbal stuff, and, th and that's also something that we talk about in the training. Yeah, and what I used to do with my clients is the first time I saw tape on them, I would turn the sound off. And I would just watch and see what messages I was getting and what I was feeling before I would ever listen to them. It was so important to see what yeah. what messages they were sending out non-verbally. And, and uh, I know that requires a, a bit of training as well. Um, so lots of people have 
the jitters or they get really nervous before they go on the air. What kind of tips do you have for that? No, well, I'm glad you asked that. You know what, though? I just want to say one quick thing when you were talking about the, the body language kind of thing. Uh -huh. You know, one of my I, – I recently worked with a chef who was a contestant on Bravo's Top Chef, and she had been a head pastry chef at the Chateau Marmont in L.A., so, you know, quite accomplished – and, but when we looked at her videos, we did have the sound up, but when we looked at them, she just didn't seem confident, and she she looked very, uh, she's blessed with looking very, very young. She's only in her 30s to begin with, but she looks like a teenager. And she just wasn't projecting like this French-trained, you know, gravitas that she really has as being a really important chef. And it, it just wasn't helping her out with her messaging at all. And I noticed that every time I saw her on television, she was never wearing a chef's coat. And so, you know, right there, I said, you got to wear the chef's coat. I mean, we need you to be projecting the authority that you have as a professional chef, as a renowned chef. And, you're, you know, when you're going on there kind of dressed like you're ready to go shopping, I mean, she looked lovely and everything, but she didn't look like a chef. So right. she just changed that one little thing. Next thing you know, she's on Martha Stewart's show. She's yucking it up with Martha. Martha's loving her. They're talking about maybe having her on a regular spot because she really is good. But she needed that one little tweak, and that was a total nonverbal thing. So that that was a good point that you made about the about yeah, the and and what you wear speaks really loudly. You know, like I, I always used to tell people, you don't want you don't want your hair, your makeup, or your earrings to enter the room before you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're exactly right. But anyway, back to nervousness, because this is the biggie. Yeah. I want to be sure we get to this. Um, you know, most people have heard that's the number one fear in America. It's even more than the fear of death, if you can believe it. So, you know, a main topic that I that I deal with with people when I'm going over sort of the, the last step of the process, which is kind of brushing them up their performance skill, is getting over nervousness so that you can be yourself and have a really great interview. And I mean, the good news is, if you've gone through all the previous steps, you really should have boosted your confidence because, you know, we've gone through all the stuff about getting your branding in line and getting ready for this, and you're a media insider because you understand how to play the game, you're in the know, and you have a blueprint of exactly what you're going to say because at this point we've already gone through your messaging. So you're armed with how to get all of that messaging into the interview, but you still might be a little jittery. I mean... I always say stepping onto a TV set for the first time is like landing on an alien planet. There's just all this stuff going on. It's not normal, you know. And, <laughs> and you know, astronauts don't try to do that without a lot of training. So I'm always saying practice is key. Yeah. You want to you wanna do a lot of those role play mock interviews with your clients, you know. And I'm sure you've done this, Ariel. I mean, there's some other tips you can use to stay calm too. Like the most simplest one is just remember remembering to breathe. You've got to you've got to take a few deep breaths in and out backstage before you start, and remember to try to breathe normally during the interview because we have a tendency to tense up and kind of hold our breath, and that makes the whole thing worse. So, you know, if you're a person who carries a lot of nervous energy in your body, I've even told people, hey, you're going to look silly, but if you can be alone somewhere backstage, jump up and down like you're like you're on a pogo stick, or just shake all around like like when your dog comes out of the bath, you know? <laughs> just get that all out of your system. Shake your arms, shake everything. And, I mean, obviously don't do that in the middle of the interview. That would be a, that would be a little weird. Um, but, you know, if you can do that, if you have, some people love essential oils like lavender or eucalyptus, whatever works for them that kind of calms their head and, you know, just gets them back, back down. I mean, back in... Remember when dot coms were moved, were just booming, like around uh -huh. late late nineties. Late nineties, I had, yeah, like around ninety nine. I had this this client, and he was the head of a the CEO of a dot com, and just sweetest guy, but you know exactly the kind of little computer genius guy that you would think. Like he was he was sweet and really really smart, but really needed to work on his people skills. And his PR people had lined him up for a bunch of interviews. And this poor guy, I mean, I came in to train him. I started, we started going through a mock interview, and he was so dang shy. That poor guy could not even look up at me. He just stared at his sneakers and mumbled. And, and I thought, 
I've got to do something. You know, this poor guy, he's going to get killed if he goes out on an interview like this. So you know, I kicked everybody out of the room, even the guy that was running the camera, and I just sat there for hours, knee to knee with this guy, just talking and encouraging and coaching him until he opened up, not just verbally, but here again, body language and all of these things. I shared some of those calming down tips and, and several more because this guy was a hard case. He needed a lot of help. And, I mean, it took it took the full day, but by the time we were done, he was awesome. I mean, he, he still came across as, you know, kind of a shy, reserved guy, but very assured because he really knew the subject matter. That wasn't the problem. He just was he just was tense about the situation because it's so unnatural. And for him, you know, he didn't do a lot of talking to women in the first place. You know, this was mo- mostly a guy that was behind the computer or dealing with other guy computer guys, you know, and the whole thing made him nervous. So, you know, I, I share that story because if that guy can conquer his stage right, then anybody on the call can. Oh, that's great. Um, why don't uh, you recap? these tips for us and then we can talk about you know how people can go more deeply into this with you sure okay so the first step was setting a baseline Um, step two was defining a media outreach plan step three was creating and polishing your media savvy brand step four is understanding how the media works step five is being mediagenic part of that was the sound bite Um, Step six, learn how to tell it to sell it. There's a lot of things that go into that. Step seven is designing and refining your key message points. And then step eight is brushing up those performance skills. And, you know, a lot of programs only focus on those last two, the message points and the performance skills. But what I really like people to know is you've got to set a nice business foundation before you even get there. And so, you know, I try to go through all eight of these with folks. So great. All right. So, so for first, I want to say that if anybody's serious about getting onto radio and TV, you have to be media trained. It's just not an option not to be. I've been trained many, many times for every book that I've done. And in fact, before I did the Today Show, I got trained every single day for seven days to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. So I was ready for it. And the interview went great. So, if people want to work with you, Deborah, what does that look like? Well, um, there's a couple of different things they can do. I would say probably the first thing um, that they should do is I do have a free three-part video training series, and that gives you like a nice little top line. It's called the top 10 mistakes authors and experts make on TV and radio and how to avoid them. And, you know, you put your, your name and your email address on that, and, and you get that delivered to you. A, a bunch of other little tips and goodies coming from me, too, after you do that. Um, I put out an e-zine, which comes out every other week, that's got all of this kind of information. And then also for the people on this call, I've created a free e-book um, that you'll also get, and that's top 10 insider tips to grab valuable media coverage. So I would say that's a good place to start. And I know that there's a, a website that they can go to. Ariel, do you have that? Or do yes, you I go do. Ahead? So here's where okay. you should go. Go to everythingyoushouldknow.com forward slash top and the number 10, everythingyoushouldknow.com forward slash T-O-P and the number 10, top 10. And that's how you can connect to Deborah and her programs. Um, You know, before I let you go, um, can you say a little bit more about how much fun it is to do interviews? Because we've been talking about how much work it is, but the truth is there's nothing more fun, really, than being on a live TV interview. Once you've done it a few times and you get used to it, isn't it the biggest rush? It it totally is, you know, and I mean, it's funny because I've had so many clients, I call it the roller coaster effect, because I've had so many clients be so nervous and stuff, they go through the training, then they do it, you know, they do a great job, and as soon as they're done, it's like, that was really fun. Can we do it again? Can we do it again? You know, it's like when you're on a roller coaster, like you're scared at first, and then you're like, hey, that was fun. And it's the same kind of rush. I mean, you just, you really, when you feel like, oh, my gosh, I, I mastered this, you know, I gave them what they wanted. I said what I wanted to say. I connected with a whole bunch more people. I got in front of a large audience because, you know, it's all, 
you could spend so much time trying to get your message out there one on one, but if you can go on a show and hit, you know, tens of thousands of people, look at how much time you just saved and you're getting what you have to share out into the world in a bigger way. And I mean, it's so gratifying. It really is. It does feel good. I know. I really, really enjoy it. Well, I want to thank you so much. It's been really useful information. And remind everybody, oh, yeah, this is media training is critical, critical, and it's never too early to start. So uh, check Deborah out, everythingyoushouldknow.com forward slash top 10, the number 10, top 10. And, right, you know, I can, give, I can give another, um, if they know that they're going to be interested in, you know, doing something, you can always write to me also, and that email address is info at comms copilot, C-O-M-M-S copilot.com and um, you know it was a pleasure to be here talking with everybody oh. and I, I just I just thank you so much Ariel this was a lot of fun all right thank you good night everybody see you next time